Good. So let's start. Uh, let me just introduce my speaker for today. Her name is Nirvana Awad. Did I say it right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I always call her Nirvana. First time I've ever said your last name, I think. Um, so Dr. Nirvana Awad is a clinical pharmacy specialist in transitional care. Uh, she works here in Montefiore Hospital. She has a doctorate from St. John's University. I completed her postgraduate residency at Montefiore Nyack. Uh, she's a board certified pharmacotherapy specialist and has presented at multiple national, regional, and local medial and pharmacy conferences. She has experience in internal medicine, critical care, and now takes a special interest in transitions of care. During this pandem pandemic, Nirvana worked with physicians to create guidelines and algorithms for the treatments of COVID-19 and updated them on a daily basis as new information emerged. She collaborated with various ICU and internal medicine teams to ensure safe and effective medication therapy. And I know for sure, just from being a patient, family member and everything, that she's always taking very good care of, not just the teams, but also the patients. So welcome Nirvana. Thank you so much, thanks for having me. Thanks mm -hmm. so much for agreeing to do this for us. I know COVID-19 is a topic everybody wants to learn more about, and especially the medications and everything. So I have a few questions for you, and we're gonna get just started now. And just to, remind everybody that there is a Q&A and a chat box available. So if you have questions for Nirvana or for myself, although I have no clue about pharmacology <laughs> of COVID, please just write your questions down either in the chat or Q&A boxes. So here we go. Why don't we start by saying what is COVID? Yeah, so that's a good question. So COVID-19 is a RNA virus, um, which is thought to believe to be originated in China, as many of you are aware. Um, it is spread by person-to-person -person, uh, contact. Um, and it actually is caused by the virus called SARS-CoV-2, which actually stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome uh, Coronavirus 2. Now, this is the second coronavirus we've seen. There, there is um, you know, information about SARS-CoV-1 virus. However, this virus kind of presented a little bit differently, which is why it was very new to a lot of clinicians. Um, so that's basically what it stands for. So it is a, a virus, it's not a bacterial infection. Um, and so we're gonna be talking about medications that really do target this virus. So what are the symptoms of COVID? What should be? What should I be expecting? Yeah, so, um, you know, unfortunately, the symptoms of COVID are very nonspecific. Um, they kind of coincide with symptoms of like the common cold or the flu. So it's really important to just kind of know um, and, you know, speak to your doctor in case you are experiencing those symptoms. So it can range anywhere between a cough or a fever. A lot of patients get headaches. Um, you know, if they have, sh if patients have shortness of breath, that tends to be more on, you know, the moderate to severe side. Um, so, and then, you know, it can also range to such severe symptoms like shortness of breath where you do have to end up coming to the hospital. Um, but it does range. Um, it can also present as like a GI upset type of symptom. But the most common symptoms we typically see are that um, really dry, persistent cough. Um, that doesn't really go away with conventional over-the-counter treatments. Um, and then as well as like the shortness of breath and the fever, those are the three most common. It does um, present a little bit differently than allergies. I did want to point that out because it is allergy season and there's a lot of pollen going around. Um, so typical symptoms of allergies are, you know, dry eyes, itchy eyes, uh, runny nose, post-nasal drip. Those typically aren't the same symptoms of COVID-19. Um, so it's just important to kind of differentiate. I think the biggest thing that we've seen here in the hospital is that persistent cough, mm -hmm. uh, definitely. Okay, should we take then over-the-counter medications and if the, the cough doesn't go away, then run to the hospital or how should we treat that? Yeah, so that's a good question. So, um, I th so one of the biggest things that I did want to mention is to really engage um, different providers and what that means is your pharmacist so if you go to the pharmacy and you are concerned 
um, about COVID, you know, some of the questions that we typically ask are, have you traveled anywhere recently? Um, have you been in contact with maybe with someone who um, hasn't really been social distancing, maybe someone who's been exposed to coronavirus? Um, so if you are uh, concerned about those things, um, it is important to um, get tested. And I think in New York, you know, this is very different from the beginning when we saw coronavirus. Right now, it's a little bit easier to get tested. Um, typically, all you have to do is, you know, give the testing center a call, describe any symptoms, and then go get a test. Um, you know, I think that the easiest thing to do is definitely try to find out whether or not you've been exposed. And if you do have a concern, um, the best thing to do is probably to get tested. And then over-the-counter treatments are also helpful to kind of control the symptoms. But just to have information about whether or not you have COVID-19 and what precautions to take then if you are positive is really important as well. Okay. Yeah, that's important to know because we might start feeling some of the symptoms and we don't know what to do, right? right? So how does COVID-19 relate to other conditions? There are people out there who have, you know, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, cancer. So do they need to have any specific precautions? What would yeah. be the deal there? Yeah, so definitely. So we have seen um, over the past few months, a lot of these patients that do have multiple chronic conditions are actually a little bit more susceptible to COVID-19. Um, and I did want to point out that, you know, these chronic conditions can be managed. So usually the patients that do present to the hospital maybe have uncontrolled diabetes or uncontrolled hypertension or um, you know, haven't been dieting or exercising and have obesity. So I think, I think it's just really important to make sure that you have your chronic conditions under control um, and then also take appropriate safety precautions if you do have those um, chronic conditions and maybe stay home, maybe not go out, you know, and everyone really should be social distancing at this time, mm -hmm. um, especially those with chronic conditions. But I did want to point out that these conditions can be exacerbated by COVID-19 or get worse if you do have COVID-19, mm -hmm. but it also makes you a little bit more susceptible if these conditions are uncontrolled. Okay, so you might have these conditions, it might be well controlled, then it's less risky than if you're out of control, Right. but then with the COVID, they could get worse, Right. correct? Okay, so what medications have been used to treat COVID-19? Yeah, so this is actually such an evolving um, question, and it's a, a question that we still ask ourselves today. Um, but as you may have seen in the news and, you know, in definitely politics and also in the literature from my end, um, hydroxychloroquine was something that was basically advertised as like the be-all, cure-all in the beginning of mm -hmm. um, the outbreak. But what we've seen is that it really hasn't been that effective, um, especially when patients come to the hospital. And there's more and more information now that is suggesting that um, it really doesn't provide that much benefit. Um, there are also other medications such as blood thinners and steroids. Um, so before I kind of go into that, I do want to talk a little bit about how COVID-19 presents and why we're using certain medications. So um, typically patients with COVID-19 either have mild, moderate, or severe illness. And in the severe illness, that's typically when patients come to the hospital where they need extra oxygen support um, or they need you know, other non-pharmacological therapies such as um, what we call proning. So if you've had COVID-19, your doctor may have told you to lay on your stomach um, to help with airflow. So um, COVID-19 definitely does prevent or present on the more mild side where you can just have a fever, cough, um, and it can go away and resolve. Um, or it can progress to symptoms such as shortness of breath that may not really get better at home. And what we've seen is that um, in the beginning, there's this uh, viral replication phase. So there's antivirals now out there, such as remdesivir, as I'm sure many of you have heard in the news, um, which is now an available a medication that we can use. Um, and then it really does progress into this pneumonia type of illness mm -hmm. that we've seen. So a lot of patients do come in with like a viral pneumonia. And it actually becomes more of like an inflammatory process. So we've seen a lot of inflammation in these patients' lungs, um, which is when patients really do progress. And if they do get sick, they may need even a ventilator to help them uh, breathe better. So there is uh, a lot of stages to COVID-19, and there are certain medications to 
kind of target different stages. So I think we're going to go into like the specific medications, but yes. Um, exactly about hydroxychloroquine. <laughs> so why is it effective? Why do they yeah. say that? So hydroxychloroquine is FDA approved for the indications of lupus um, and malaria. So it actually has antiviral uh, effects mm -hmm. as well as it is an immune modulator. And what that means is it really targets the immune system. So it was thought because of, there was one study that showed that it actually inhibited the virus um, in a cell. So it, it wasn't really tested in humans in the beginning. It was really more of like, they took out human cells and tested it to see if it was effective. Um, and they saw that it could be effective, right? And this is kind of a, a widely available medication in the beginning of COVID, in the beginning of the pandemic, um, that people were really questioning, you know, should we use it, should we not use it? So um, this was something that was off-label uh, used, and the FDA basically granted an emergency use authorization. And what that means is they basically said, you know, they recognized the urgency of the situation and allowed for the distribution of hydroxychloroquine to be used for coronavirus. Um, however, as more and more information emerged, and with the experience of hydroxychloroquine, um, it actually hasn't really been shown to prevent any of the symptoms of COVID-19. Um, and we've seen that it's not really effective in preventing those intubations and preventing those, um, the progression of the disease. Mm -hmm. So hydroxychloroquine, I would say, has fallen less out of, um, has fallen out of favor as the primary treatment for COVID-19. Not to mention, uh, it is not a benign medication. It does have a lot of side effects. Uh, one being it has a lot of cardiac complications. So you can have, you know, potentially life-threatening arrhythmias with hydroxychloroquine. So this was actually a concern of mine being a pharmacist, you know, when patients were getting this in the outpatient center, they weren't being appropriately monitored. Um, the way that we usually monitor for these things for arrhythmias is through EKGs. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these patients were at home taking the medication so they wouldn't be able to tell whether or not it was really affecting them. So long story short, I think hydroxychloroquine um, is not that effective for the treatment of COVID-19. And, and you know, the reality of it is we do have better options and we, we know how to manage COVID-19 a little bit better now. So. so you just mentioned hydroxychloroquine is a treatment for lupus. And right. we were just talking about diabetes and obesity and all these other chronic diseases. So right. actually, we got a question from one of our attendees. What would be the complication for people with lupus, actually? Do they do differently with the COVID because of, you know, the medications yeah. and the complications? Yeah, so that's actually a really good question. There actually hasn't been any studies, uh, from what I know, of looking at specifically lupus patients to see if they were less susceptible to COVID-19. Um, it is possible that they were, but we're not really, at this point, we can't make any conclusive, um, there is no conclusive, there's evidence. No conclusive evidence to say whether or not, you know, hydroxychloroquine, if patients were on it long-term prior to COVID-19, if that had any impact. We really aren't sure about that. We just know that if we're using hydroxychloroquine for COVID-19, if you, you know, have a positive test, um, that it, it probably isn't effective as the only treatment. And if the patient had lupus but wasn't in any medication, does it matter or? At this point, we, we don't know, but I would say that it doesn't really um, matter whether or not they were on or not on hydroxychloroquine. Yeah. 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 So, you know, the problem with COVID is it's very unknown. It's yeah. like everything about COVID is really yeah. new. To everybody. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons why I did I did want to do this um, webinar because I think that there's a lot of misinformation out there, yes. and I think it's really easy to get caught up in the news and what's going on. So I think it's important just to kind of let you know what from my experience and from the recent literature that's out there what's happening. And because we're here treating real right. patients, <laughs> yes. you know, with real medications, right. we're on top of the game here. Yes. So the, our next question is. Talk to us about esteroids and blood thinners. They're widely used with these patients. What's going on? Why? Yeah, so in the, in the beginning, um, steroids were actually said to prolong the virus or prolong viral shedding. So a lot of, patients, a lot of physicians were saying, you know, we should have used steroids, we shouldn't use steroids. Now, actually, that we're learning that it's more of an inf inflammation process going on where, um, you know, similar to how 
you know, asthmatics or COPD exacerbations, where it is this uh, inflammation in the lungs, mm -hmm. steroids have actually uh, been beneficial in these patients. And I think it really depends on how the patient presents. So that doesn't mean that if you have like a mild fever or a cough at home and you don't really develop shortness of breath that you should be on steroids. Um, it really is, is a useful medication if you're in the hospital or if you see your doctor and you say, you know, doctor really can't breathe. Um, we know that steroids can be uh, beneficial in managing those symptoms. Now the blood thinners was actually really interesting. So um, some patients are also on blood thinners for other indications such as atrial fibrillation mm -hmm. or you know other reasons heart disease, or you way, know right? heart disease yeah so um blood thinners was actually something that we found to be beneficial because we did see a lot of these patients come in and develop blood clots mm -hmm. um and what we've learned uh from autopsies uh, mm -hmm. of you know patients that have passed away is that patients tend to uh, develop the more severe patients i should say tend to develop blood clots in the lung as well as other areas um, in the legs and why this happens is because of the inflammatory process I was saying, um, where it actually activates some of the uh, coagulation or blood, um, blood clotting factors um, to be more of a pro-thrombotic phase. So a lot of these patients were coming in saying we can't breathe, you know, there's shortness of breath there. Um, and we found that blood thinners really help um, manage that. We also do monitor different labs that let us know whether or not there is a clot process going on. Um, but blood thinners are definitely, I would say a lot of institutions are looking into that and there, there are ongoing clinical trials looking at blood thinners for COVID-19. So it's basically, it's not gonna cure the COVID, but it's gonna at least help to prevent some of the clots right. that might end up killing people. Right, the complications yeah, associated right. with it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, what about antibiotics? Because you know, like people love antibiotics, they feel sick, they're always running to the doctor for yeah. an antibiotic prescription. Yeah, so um, there is really no role for antibiotics in the treatment of COVID-19. Like I said earlier, COVID-19 is a viral illness. Uh, so antibiotics don't work with viruses because they target bacteria. Um, so we really need to look at antiviral treatment for COVID-19 and not antibiotics. So you know, in the community, you know, if you feel sick, sometimes your yeah. doctor might prescribe you a Z pack or uh, a different antibiotic to help you feel better. But if you know you're positive for COVID-19, um, antibiotics really don't do much. Um, and they actually do more harm if you use them mm -hmm. inappropriately because it does increase the risk of resi what we call antibiotic resistance in the community, which is an ongoing problem. Meaning that if you do develop an infection, um, and you have resistance or you've been exposed to antibiotics in the past, that the likelihood of your current infection to be susceptible or to have the antibiotics work on that infection is actually low. So we really wanna reserve antibiotics for the treatment of actual bacterial infections rather than viral infections. Yeah, I know that, you know, when we feel sick, we need to know what kind of disease it is. Like before, everything used to be bacteria, and we used to get a lot of antibiotics. And I know that at least among the Hispanic community, you know, we consider everything to be treated with antibiotics, but it's very dangerous. So right. it's important to know that antibiotics are for bacterial infections, while COVID-19 is a virus and it should be treated differently. Right. Correct? Correct. Good. So just a reminder to all of our participants that we have a Q&A box and also a chat box. So if you guys wanna ask any questions during the course of this meeting, just feel free to use those boxes and share your questions with us. Convalescent plasma. Yes, <laughs> the hot topic. <laughs> yes, okay. So convalescent plasma, um, if as many of you are aware, is a treatment that uses patients um, who recovered from COVID, so you've had to have a COVID positive test and you had to have recovered from COVID, they actually use their antibodies um, and you can donate your plasma and give it to a patient that is sick with COVID-19. Um, and those antibodies actually work to target the virus. So this is actually similar, it's a similar mechanism to a vaccine, um, but the great news with plasma is that it's easily, um, readily accessible, meaning that, you know, all you need is a donor, someone that's been recovered 
um, from COVID-19 and is now donating their plasma to the recipient who is now sick and struggling. Uh, the question of is it effective, we have seen uh, really great results with convalescent plasma, at least in Lanvir Nyack. We've seen it um, to be effective with its use earlier. So uh, we don't necessarily wait until patients are on the ventilator to give plasma. We actually use it um, earlier uh, in, in their stay, so. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, we are getting showered with questions. Oh, sure. <laughs> so, uh, so why don't we start uh, answering some of them? Okay. Because they're related to what we're talking sure. about right now. So if you, one of them is, what would you recommend for moderate uh, diagnosis and patients who are not admitted but symptomatic? Okay, so that's a great question. So um, at this point, what I would recommend if you're at home is to obviously social distance yourself, quarantine. And in terms of medication therapy, you do wanna make sure that you continue any medications that you're on for, like I said, your chronic conditions. Um, there is some data with over-the-counter remedies, and I know we're gonna be talking about that. Um, it's not really strong data to support it, but it's something that you can consider, So, and it's really not that harmful. So things like vitamin C, mm -hmm. taking a daily multivitamin um, will help, and I just wanna put a disclaimer out there that these are not cures for COVID-19, um, but it, it can help boost with your immune the system. Symptoms, and also with the symptoms, right? right? exactly. Yeah. Um, at this point, for patients at home, we don't have like an oral uh, antiviral that, you know, is like Tamiflu, for example, for the flu that you can just take home at home. Um, but it's really important to remain social distance and quarantine and really just provide yourself with supportive care. One thing I do want to mention that we found to be really effective, and actually physicians are recommending this to their patients at home, is to try leaning uh, on your stomach, what we call the prone position. So if you do have shortness of breath, um, you know, the first thing you should definitely do is talk to your doctor about your symptoms because if it is severe enough that you, it is warranted to come to the hospital, I do want to stress that we shouldn't um, be afraid of coming to the hospital. You know, we're here to help and there's definitely important safety precautions that we take here in the hospital to make sure that everyone is safe. Um, but if your doctor doesn't think that, you know, you really need a hospitalization, then you, you can try lying on your stomach. It can make you feel a little bit better with your breathing. Mm -hmm. um, and if that doesn't really help, then give your doctor a call or talk to your pharmacist and see you know, if, if, if this is something that needs uh, extra warranted care, like coming to the hospital or even an urgent care and seeing what, you know, what they need to do at that point. Yeah. Um, okay, mm -hmm. so let's keep moving. Home harmonies, that's yeah. kind of related <laughs> to what you were saying, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, so, um, you know, I think that unfortunately with over-the-counter medications, people don't typically pay attention with them uh, in studies because they're relatively cheap. Uh, they're already available. So pharma companies usually like to promote a drug that they are, you know, in development with. We have seen uh, patients come in on like vitamin C and also zinc um, as well. Mm -hmm. I will say that these these don't really have much harm to them. You know, they're they're relatively safe medications to take. You definitely don't want to take too much of them. Like you don't want to you want to stick to the what's on the package. So if it's one tablet a day, take only one tablet a day. Um, but you know, those again, they're not anything that is known to prevent or treat COVID nineteen. But it can help with your immune system and um, being able to yeah control yeah. the symptoms. Vitamin D, I've heard about vitamin D yeah. as well. People are out there taking vitamin D. It seems like there is some kind of relationship between people who got in bad COVID having low vitamin D levels. Yeah. So they're recommending also to increase the intake of vitamin D in order to help to avoid or lessen the symptoms of COVID-19. I yeah. don't know, have you heard anything about that? Yeah, so there, again, these are all what I, what I would say associations. So what that means is that if we've noticed a trend with patients coming in with low vitamin D levels, it doesn't necessarily mean that if you have low vitamin D, you are more likely to get COVID-19. It just means that this mm -hmm. is an observation. Um, so we can't say that vitamin D will prevent COVID-19. Or cure it. Or cure it, right? But if you are known to have low vitamin D levels, um, it would help to make sure that you're, you know, you continue your vitamin D. Yeah, and, and your immune system is better, everything is kind right. of better, right? Okay, 
and we have talked about what to do, you yes. know, keep distancing your Wear masks, your mask. yeah. <laughs> and your hands, you need to be washing yeah. and all of that. Right. Um, even if the numbers are going down, correct? Mm -hmm. So we can't just say, oh, the numbers are going down, goodbye masks, and I'm not gonna wash my hands. We should always wash our hands, no matter what. Um, what about if I'm positive for COVID-19, like if I had the antibodies, mm -hmm. right? Like for example, I went for antibody testing right. and I got the antibodies, I don't even know how. Mm -hmm. Can I still give it to someone? But can I, can I still give COVID to someone else? Yeah, so this is actually really important. Um, it's unlikely that you will, but I will say that there hasn't been conclusive evidence to suggest that you aren't infectious if you have antibodies. Um, so it is important to remain social distancing. Um, you know, all of these guidelines and precautions are in place not to really inconvenience people, but it's really mm -hmm. just because mm -hmm. we don't have a lot of good information about prevention. Yeah, prevention and transmission. So um, if you don't have symptoms, but you're positive, yes, you can give it to someone else because a lot of patients are positive and don't get symptoms at all. And you can still transmit it to your family member, to your loved one, to someone mm -hmm. within six feet of you. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the symptoms is not what, what transmits the virus. It's really, um, you know, how early, when did you get uh, exposed to COVID-19? So the duration and also um, if you're positive or not, you know, we're not really mm -hmm. sure uh, when that infectivity period ends. And I think that there is something else about, you know, be, like this antibody testing. Like, mm -hmm. I feel that uh, people just believe that because I already have the antibodies, I'm not gonna be able to get COVID again. Yeah, so that's actually something that is being looked at now, but it's not something that, you know, has been thoroughly studied to be able to say patients can't get COVID-19 again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I still keep getting questions, so please mm -hmm. keep sending them. We're gonna answer those, all those questions at the end, okay? So just keep sending them. And I keep checking on the questions to see if they're relevant to what we're talking about. Then we're uh, answering them little by little. And let's talk about foods or supplements. And I just read a question about it. What about elder, elderberry syrup to boost, boost immunity? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, you'll see a lot of packaging over the counter if you go into your local pharmacy that says, you know, so-and-so boosts immunity. Yes. Um, and I do want to mention that over-the-counter medications, although the, you know, vitamins and supplementation is great if you need it, these medications that are over-the-counter are not FDA regulated. Mm -hmm. So they can technically put those labels on the boxes and it doesn't really tell you anything, doesn't really mean anything. Um, so you know, the claims of boosting immunity and whether or not that helps with COVID-19, it's, it's really unknown and it's all speculation. Um, I will say that you need to really be careful with over-the-counter supplements you take because they may interact with a lot of medications that you get um, at the pharmacy, like prescription medications. So anything that you do buy over-the-counter, just let your pharmacist know um, and that way they can do a quick profile scan of what you're taking and see if there are any interactions with that specific over-the-counter medication. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, and same about some of the, of the foods. I mean, they might be super foods, they might be packed with vitamins and all right. of that, but they're not cure or anything. Right. You know, it just helps your body, you know, it helps your system, but there is not a specific food that you're going to be eating that it's going to help either prevent or cure COVID-19. So... Um, again, just a reminder, please keep, a, keep, please keep asking, and what about the vaccine? What do you know about the vaccine? Yeah. Are we close to having <laughs> a vaccine so that we can all be happy and free again? So that's a good question. It's a question many of us ask. Um, so the vaccine, from what I've recently seen, is that there's one vaccine that entered into a phase three clinical trial. And phase three typically means that they are testing it in a larger uh, human population, which is great news. Um, however, vaccines do not, at this point, we don't know if they will really prevent COVID-19. Similar to how you get the flu shot, you know, patients can say, oh, I got the flu and I got, you know, I took the flu I shot got, and I got yeah. the flu. Well, you know, how did that happen? Well, you know, what we do know is that the vaccine 
um, produces antibodies in your body to prevent. And I do want to mention that this vaccine is a dead virus vaccine. So if you do get the flu shot, which is also a dead virus, you should also be eligible to get this vaccine when it does come to market. Um, and I think, you know, patients that are immunosuppressed typically ask this question, can I get this vaccine because I have this condition? Um, all of the vaccines, what I've seen in clinical trials are looking at a dead virus vaccine. So it's, it's okay for those patients as well. Um, but, you know, to say that you're not going to get COVID-19 with the vaccine is not really warranted. We don't know it at this point because we have to kind of look at it at a broader scale. Um, but we do know that it does um, present with antibodies when you get it. So if you are exposed to COVID-19 or if you're positive with COVID-19 after getting the vaccine, we do expect for you to have a better immunologic response to the virus. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping that that really does prevent patients from getting really sick, like mm -hmm. what we've seen in the in the news and unfortunately in the hospital with patients passing away. So. You know, what I always tell my patients about the flu shot, because mm -hmm. a lot of people are like, well, but you get the flu shot and you get the flu, it's like, well, it will have been a worse flu if exactly. you didn't get the vaccine. So exactly. I think it's kind of the same with COVID and same for people who are now getting COVID. It's like a natural vaccine that they're getting. That doesn't mean that they're not going to get it again. Exactly. It's just we expect that because you already have some antibodies, your response yeah. is not going to be as severe as yeah. the first time. I also want to just piggyback off of that as well. It is extremely important to also get your flu shot this year. Um, oh, because yes. we're not sure, you know, how the virus is going to interact with the flu. We've seen a little bit about um, with it in February, where we were questioning whether or not patients had the flu versus COVID. Yes. Um, but come the fall, you know, there is an expectation that it could be worse due to the flu. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that a lot of patients are not getting uh, vaccinated because of this earlier on, I would say in February. So it's important once, the, once those flu shots come out, you definitely want to go to your local pharmacy. Um, or your doctor to get your flu shot. Yeah, it's just like helping your body be stronger against right. disease. That's what really vaccines are about. So it's important to get all your vaccines on time. Let's talk a little bit about telehealth mm -hmm. and why it's such a good use now during this COVID-19 pandemic. And believe it or not, this is a way of telehealth, right? Yeah. Like we're providing all this information I must the director of community. I cannot be <laughs> out there with my kids. <laughs> but, you know, this is our way of getting there. So telecommunications. Yeah, so telehealth is, um, you know, it's always been kind of available. But I always say that healthcare hasn't really caught up to technology um, in the sense that uh, the way that, I don't know if you guys know, but Medicare and CMS reimburses uh, physicians, they haven't typically included telehealth in their previous reimbursements. Now we've seen with this pandemic that a lot of physician offices actually had to like close down or limit the amount of patients they've been seeing and move a lot of their patients towards telehealth. Um, and a lot of this is because CMS actually recognized that this is a national pandemic and they made adjustments accordingly to their um, payment program. So physicians are getting reimbursed for telehealth. Um, and that's why you're really starting to see a surge with the use of telehealth and I think a lot of physicians and pharmacists now that are using it that I know um, are, are seeing a lot of benefit with telehealth. Mm -hmm. I personally have used telehealth for my patients previously um, before COVID-19 mm -hmm. because I look at you know other patients with different conditions, but I think we're still gonna be uh, using telehealth even after COVID-19 and after the surge because we've noticed that we have better communication with our patients. Um, and typically we, you know, we have, uh, good use of it, and there's been a lot of uh, recent platforms that are really using the telehealth uh, field to kind of engage providers, insurances, mm -hmm. and all these different players in the healthcare system. And, and sometimes just the fact of um, being it easier for you to communicate with your provider through a screen or your right. phone than having to transport yourself exactly. from your home to a doctor's office, especially in Brooklyn, like transportation, public transportation isn't great if you don't yeah. have a car, you know, so it's like teletransporting yourself to the doctor's office. Yeah. So I love it too. I also do telehealth with some of my yeah. patients outside here and it's great, works great. Okay, so which healthcare professionals are easily accessible if you have a question regarding your health or medications? Yeah. 
And I'm gonna add to this question because in, in our Q&A, we saw another question. After you have COVID-19, what specialist or what doctor should be following up with? Is mm -hmm. it a pulmonologist or an internal medicine That's doctor or your PCP? Who needs to take care of you? I think that relates to this question. It's a great question. So healthcare professionals that are easily accessible, I would say your primary care provider, most mm -hmm. primary care providers are uh, now switching over to telehealth and now are accepting patients. So if you feel like you need to come in and get examined, you know, you could still um, do that. As well as your pharmacist, you know, pharmacists have always been the most accessible healthcare professional. So if you do have a question about your medication specifically um, or your health, you can just call your pharmacist or walk into the store and ask them. In terms of following up um, if you've had COVID-19, I would definitely recommend reaching out to your primary care provider. Mm -hmm. Those are the doctors that are under, you know, looking at your entire uh, portfolio and are not just focusing on one area of your health. So pulmonologists specialize in the lungs and uh, same thing with cardiologists with the heart. So um, if your primary care provider feels that you still need to follow up with your pulmonologist, they'll give you a referral to talk to your pulmonologist. I do want to stress that primary care providers really have a good understanding as a whole of what's going on with all of your chronic conditions and not just really one specialty. Um, and we've seen this a lot in the pharmacy world too, where patients are on multiple medications from different doctors yes. and sometimes they don't really communicate with each other. Um, so that's why I really say engage your pharmacist because those are, you know, healthcare professionals that are really looking at your entire profile and seeing whether the medications you're on are appropriate um, or if you do need to follow up with, with someone specifically. So, mm -hmm. very good. Okay, <laughs> we're going to give you a little breather uh, <laughs> now and we're going to start asking some questions to the audience. Great. So we're gonna do a little poll and then we're gonna fall into our Q&A. Uh, thank you for all of you who have been ask, asking questions. You see, I keep, I'm keeping an eye on them. So let's just do a little poll. And if you can just please answer true or false to the questions that you, have, that you see appearing on your screen. Uh, we only have five questions. So please go ahead and you can start answering. I learned new information today. <laughs> True or false, are there already FDA approved medications for COVID-19? True or false, I should stop taking my medications at home if I test positive for COVID-19. It's always best to use telehealth during this pandemic. I would recommend this webinar to others to watch. So I see how the polls are coming in. Isn't this fun? Yeah. I love this. Okay, four or five answers so far. We have like 30 participants. So I'm, I'm hoping we can get <laughs> at least 20 people to play the poll with us. Okay, we have 10 people who voted. Let's go up there and see the answers it's, for the first one. The answers. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. So 13, I would like to get at least half of people to join the poll. So if at least two or three more people could play the poll with us, that would be great. Okay, one more. <laughs> one more person. Okay. I think I'm showing everybody the answers for the poll. So most people have learned new information today. Are there already FDA approved medications for COVID? So the answer is, the correct answer is false. Mm -hmm. There are no FDA approved medications for COVID-19 at this time. Okay. Uh, if you've seen in the news, the FDA may grant an emergency use authorization, but that's a little bit different than an approved indication uh, for COVID-19. Okay. Uh, then the next one, I should stop taking my medications at home. Most people say false. Good, good. good. Yeah. Please keep <laughs> taking those medications yeah. for God's Very sake. Important. Yes. It's always best to use telehealth. Yeah, so I will say it really depends on how you present. I, think, mm -hmm. I would say the answer is true, just to kind of talk to your doctor about what symptoms you're experiencing. 
And it kind of acts like a triage if you think about it. So if your doctor feels that, you know, maybe you should come into the office and get examined, uh, then they'll tell you to come in. But yes. telehealth is a good starting mm -hmm. point, I would say. Yes, mm -hmm. I, will, I will agree with you. Like, you know, there are some conditions that the doctor will require to see you. Right. It's good to just start with a televisit. Right. And then let your doctor know if you actually need to come in or not for a checkup or go to the emergency room or something. Yes. And most people say, yes, I will recommend this webinar to others. Great. So good news. We're recording this webinar. <laughs> we're going to be posting it so you can share it with your friends and tell them that you were there live, I guess. <laughs> okay. Should we look at other questions? Yes. So let's move to some of the questions that we have, Nirvana. Let's start with the Q&A box. Uh, have they considered an anti-inflammatory diet as a public health prevention to have a better response to COVID-19? Or are there studies to be able to demonstrate the impact mm -hmm. it might have? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I would say there aren't ongoing studies specifically looking at inflammation in the diet. Um, I would say having a healthy, heart healthy diet, you know, things that we already tell patients is um, probably going to have a major impact. Um, what we've seen is if uh, you have obesity, that also increases mm -hmm. your risk of getting COVID-19. Um, so, you know, being overweight in general is not really that great for any condition, and we've seen kind of the same thing with COVID-19, so it's yes. important to maintain a good uh, overall healthy diet. And, and if I might interrupt, as a, as a registered dietitian, what we've yeah. seen is that, you know, people who got the worst impact of COVID-19 were people with diabetes, right. obesity, you know, these are chronic diseases that are related to diet and nutrition. Right. So definitely having a better diet that boosts your immune response, you know, plenty of fruits, vegetables, like fresh foods, not necessarily organic, but right. fresh, home-cooked meals, mm -hmm. you know, controlling intake of sugar, making sure that, that you drink enough liquids definitely helps on the impact of COVID either to prevent or to treat. Right. Would you agree? I agree, yes. Okay. So I another question. I heard that people with certain type of blood were more susceptible to get the virus. Is it true? Yeah, this is something that is going on in the news yes. and it's something <laughs> that I think, you know, we have to be really careful about how we read the news and things that get reported out and because Facebook and yeah, social media because news. unfortunately yes. you know these these claims are not based on any really good evidence and that's kind of like the shocking thing with COVID-19 especially for me is seeing all these reports for example I don't know if anyone's heard about so to answer this question certain type of blood uh, we don't know and you know to make an assumption like that is unwarranted because there hasn't been real good evidence um, but I've seen something about, you know, dexamethasone. We already know steroids have been pretty beneficial in COVID patients. But when you look at the trial that everyone's kind mm -hmm. of touting, they haven't even released their results yet. It's really just like a press release. So we can't really extrapolate what that means. When, you know, it's like me or you going on the web, yeah. a website and just saying, hey, we found the cure to COVID. You know, it's not really uh, warranted uh, until we have, and the same thing happened with remdesivir actually. But until yes. we have good True. evidence, um, you know, in a published journal, in a peer-reviewed journal, uh, we don't really know those mm -hmm. answers. Um, so we just have to be careful with, like, yeah. you know, things that we've seen. But definitely important to ask the question, so thank you for asking. Yes. And, and same thing happened with vitamin D. I actually yeah. had a question from a family member. Is this true? Vitamin D is the cure, you yeah. know, or, or Zantac. I also heard about yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So next question, are they using plasma from people that already have the virus as an option for yes. treatment? That's a, yes, so we are. Um, we're using convalescent plasma, which is um, plasma from healthy patients that had COVID-19 um, and have an antibody response. So you have to be positive for antibodies and have a positive test um, in the past. And we are using that plasma and giving it to patients that are sick with COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And we've seen actually really good results. No, I'm curious. I know that here at Montefiore Naya, we're doing it. Is yes. every hospital doing it? Or I think, I believe it's not every hospital. It's just trial hospitals. 
old school way. So actually right now, um, yes, it is within a clinical trial, but I believe the blood bank for New York State is kind of organizing who gets it and where. Um, but yes, it is being looked at through clinical trials and we are a site for the clinical trial for convalescent plasma. So mm -hmm. it's something that we do here at non okay. Yeah. Uh, this is a question I don't know if you know the answer, sure. uh, but now I'm thinking we might bring Sue Stone also to talk and do a webinar for us. Yeah. She's <laughs> our director of infections diseases. So, how long does COVID leave on surfaces? How long? I'm sorry. Does how COVID long does COVID live, live okay. on, on surfaces? surfaces? Yeah. So um, the studies that I've seen have, you know pretty much showed a couple of hours. Mm -hmm. And so that's where you have to be really careful with surfaces. You wanna wipe everything down before you use it. Um, and I will say that a lot of patients think that gloves is like an answer yes. because you're not gonna be touching the surface if you have a glove on. But you have to be really careful with gloves because if you put it on, and let's say like I've seen people put on gloves, pump their gas, and then go back in their car and then touch the yes. steering wheel. So that actually defeats the purpose because now you've contaminated your steering wheel. It's like the gloves, the gloves yeah. are, are catching and moving the right. virus moving around, around just like you would do with your hands. Exactly. You have to be washing your gloves every time. Yeah. They're disposable. Yeah. I don't know how good they are after you wash them. So yeah, so no, gloves are pretty much like single use items. You, you, know, you either use it and you take it off and, and sanitize or you don't use it and you sanitize after you touch surfaces and wipe everything down. So because the virus does live on surfaces for um, hours, it's not, it's not really known how, mm -hmm. specifically how long, but. Okay. Next question. I had a friend that was, that used acetromycin, an anti-inflammatory medication, and gets better and recovers from COVID-19, but doctors were telling people to rest and take acetaminophen when did not help much. Okay, so anti-inflammatory, I'm assuming it was steroids maybe. It was the anti, like a prednisone or something. But so, azithromycin, isn't that an antibiotic? So azithromycin is an antibiotic, um, and so it will not work for COVID-19. Now I'm gonna assume that this uh, friend was positive for COVID, so you know azithromycin wouldn't work. Um, and the anti-inflammatory probably did, a, you know, probably helped her um, rather than the azithromycin. So prednisone maybe helped. Um, and then says, doctor, who talking about rest and take. Yeah, so Tylenol is, you know, we know that it helps with fevers. So it helps you, it makes you feel better because you're not, you know, your head isn't too warm and it helps with. It helps um, you feel better. It's not yeah. gonna cure you, but it helps with the Right, sense. it's just for symptoms, yeah. But azithromycin really doesn't do much. I know there was talk about hydroxychloroquine with azithromycin. Yeah. We know that that's not effective. Uh, anymore, so or it was never effective really. And the anti inflammatories we talked about steroids, so mm -hmm. yeah. They're also asking about miracle mineral solution. Have you heard of that? I have no idea what that is. Miracle mineral solution, yes. So if you can give us a little bit more information about what that is, maybe yeah, you might be I can able. look into that, but I haven't okay. heard that one. That's a new now, one. what about blood donation? Is it safe to donate blood during this time? You know, that's actually a great question. Um, I would, so your blood, your serum blood is different than your antibodies, your plasma. So I would say that if you're not sick and if you have no other conditions, uh, you should be able to donate blood, but you would have to kind of talk to your, the, you know, the blood bank or wherever you donate to see whether or not you're eligible. Because if you have an active infection, or you were positive maybe a week ago, they may not let you donate blood. So I think it really right. does depend on how long ago you were infected or if you even you know, were infected at all. So, yeah. Although they want your plasma if you were infected and you've been post-COVID for a few weeks, right? They want that. Right, but you have to have positive antibodies to donate right. plasma. Yes, exactly. Okay, so patients with COVID often complain of continuing burning in the chest and lungs mm -hmm. long after the 14-day illness course. Why is this something that persists and how to treat this? Okay, so that's a great question. So what we've seen is, you know, in the beginning phases, the symptoms might not be that severe, but in the later phases of the virus, you may get more shortness of breath and that burning sensation on the chest that can be suggestive of something a little bit more serious. 
Um, so I would recommend to talk to the physician. Um, we have seen patients come in with like, and I don't want to scare anyone, but someone with like a heart attack or something like that. Usually it is patients that have other underlying mm -hmm. cardiac conditions, but definitely any chest pain, you want to definitely tell your doctor about right away because this could be something suggestive of mm -hmm. uh, a more severe type of reaction. How to treat this inhalers, like I said, if it's re regarding chest pain or really severe shortness of breath, uh, you may need even oxygen support. Uh, inhalers at home may be beneficial. You know, if you get better, that's great. If not, uh, you know, that's something you definitely want to let your doctor know about. So based on the question and what you're saying, would it be okay to assume, hold on, no, I'm sure I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, would it be okay to assume that if you still have this continuous burning sensation, you might not be completely healed and it's best to be under medical Yes, check out. Absolutely, yes. So, so right. we typically, you know, we've seen prolonged, prolonged viral courses. So mm -hmm. patients that have been sick for, you know, over a month. And usually those patients do present to the hospital in a more like severe condition to begin with. You know, not just your typical fever, uh, you know, mm -hmm. cough, things like that. But if you have shortness of breath, if you have that chest pain, that's what I'm saying. It's, be it's best to get uh, checked out um, just because yeah. you may need additional care. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, just the way that I'm thinking and, and just thinking from the community side, you know, it's it, you have a heart attack. You know, the COVID is really gotten to be a very serious disease mm -hmm. for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. You know, just the same as you can recover from a heart attack and you need rehab or you break a leg and you need rehab, you know, COVID-19 might, might not need rehab in that way, but it might need a period yeah. of rehabilitation yeah. where you really need to breathe better and all yeah. of that. And right? we've seen that with patients that do get better uh, here in the hospital. We send them to rehab centers if they need additional right. care or step down units. Um, I will say that COVID-19 did not erase other conditions. So if you have signs of, let's say, a stroke, or if you have signs of, you know, chest pain, usually, you know, before COVID-19, people will say, well, I have this really bad chest pain. Mm -hmm. uh, I need medical attention. So COVID didn't really erase any of those symptoms. You may have something else going on that isn't related to COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So um, the next question is about the treatment that Italian doctors were doing. Do you know anything about, are they doing anything different in Italy than what we're doing now um, here? So in the very beginning, I was following a lot of the Italian literature. They had a lot of good literature on steroid use. Um, so it was actually pretty conflicting with steroids, but mm -hmm. what we've come to, you know, the conclusion is that steroids are beneficial, but it really depends on when you initiate steroids. So it doesn't mean everyone should be on steroids, but maybe oh, those patients I that see. are okay. a little bit more sick, maybe prior to being on a ventilator, or even um, if they have evidence of inflammation in their labs, they could benefit from steroids. So you just shouldn't be in, in, in esterase like they are vitamins or something? No, right? no absolutely not. It okay. needs to be, um, you know, because some, then you might think, well, I had COVID and I wasn't on steroids, but my friend had COVID and she went on steroids. So, you, you know, people mm -hmm. present differently. And I feel that, you know, learning your underlying conditions is very important as well. It's, yeah. You cannot treat all diseases the same just because my neighbor did it this way. Right. You know, like all bodies are different. Right. And we really need to be checking with your doctor or pharmacist or, you know, whomever your primary care provider is right. to make sure that whatever you take is not going to be bad for you. Yeah. You know, we tend to replicate everything that we hear is not safe. Right. Unfortunately. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. So have you heard about transfer factors? Are they good or safe? Transfer factors, I'm not sure. I'm not aware of what that is. I can get back to you though. I'm not really okay. sure. Okay, is so that... yeah, no, I'm not. I haven't heard about transfer factors, but maybe we can talk about some risk factors. Okay. Like, like what will be risk factors for COVID-19? Yeah, so we kind of went over that. So mm -hmm. uh, like we said, uncontrolled diabetes, hypertension, um, if you're maybe immunosuppressed, if, you know, if you're elderly, really, you know, maybe over 70 years old, um, what do we say, diabetes, obesity is a big obesity. one. Uh, so those are risk factors for obtaining COVID-19, as well as just being, um, you know, 
not really social distancing. I think that's mm -hmm. the biggest thing people take, you know, lightly. Uh, the reality of it is if you're out and about and not wearing a mask or if you're close to someone that you may not know where they've been, it also increases your chances. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. It's it's just a scary. And, and now that the numbers are starting to come down, I myself have seen, you know, full parks, people without yeah. wearing masks, people walking around, you know, in groups and not wearing masks. Yeah. I'm already seeing people in restaurants, you know, even yeah. though they're sitting outside, the tables are still pretty close together. Yeah. And if you're eating with friends and stuff, you're not going to be wearing a mask while you're eating. Right. So please be careful out there. So we also put a list of resources together. Uh, they're here. So if you want more information on COVID-19, these are good resources. You can take a picture if you want um, of this slide uh, because it is good to get trustful information about COVID-19. We see a lot of things in social media, not all, not all yeah. of them are true. Actually, a lot of them are, are not true. true. <laughs> so please go to good sources for yes. information. You can't stress that enough. <laughs> oh, please. We also have a COVID hotline mm -hmm. here in Montefiore, Naya, 845-348-2055. So if you have questions, please just call us. And if you have uh, more inform if you want more information about our webinars, where to find them, or if you have further questions for us or suggestions for topics that you want us to talk about, either shoot us an email at communityhealth@montefiornayak.org or call us 845-348-2004. Okay, I see. Maybe there are some questions that are still coming sure. in. Uh, I can answer one more, I guess, if it's it, that one, I wasn't sure. Okay, so <laughs> we have time for one more question. Let's see over here. I can no longer hear. Oh. Okay, well, it's over anyway. <laughs> okay, yes. So um, thank you very much to all of you who joined us today. We are very happy to to have shared um, with this time with you and be able to provide hopefully some good information and we'll chat next week next week we are going to be talking about lgbtq care nice. during covid okay and to celebrate five months later right? and you're going to be able to access the recording later i just want to mention yes. that because someone said they couldn't hear <laughs> yes so if you couldn't hear very well you're going to be able to access the recording we're going to be letting you be letting you know when it's going to come live we're starting a monte Fernaya youtube channel <laughs> new thanks new thanks okay thank you so much thank you bye bye